It's time for the Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope? They are CBS News correspondents, Larry LeSeur and Robert Trout. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable John J. Sparkman, United States Senator from Alabama. What we've been able to gather on Chronoscope in the past few weeks, the congressional emphasis in the next year will be on trying to keep this country at its present high level of economic prosperity. Our guest tonight, the Democratic candidate for Vice President in 1952, will be the chairman of the Joint Congressional Economic Committee. Senator Sparkman, do you think there's anything out of line with the economy right now? How about the uh, stock market, for example? Well, Larry, let me say, of course, it would be uh, pretty difficult at any time to say that everything was in line. Some things are out of line, of course, and the stock market, I think, is one of them. Uh, generally speaking, uh, we have a reasonable degree of uh, uh, stability, but the stock market has been acting up here of late, and uh, I, frankly, I don't, I, I don't know what causes it. Well, do you think it's running ahead of prospects for business in the coming year, sir? Larry, the thing about it, it's been jumpy. Uh, it, it has gone up uh, unusually fast, spurty. And I think that uh, is something that is, uh, well, I, I don't know what it means. I think it's something we ought to watch pretty carefully. Do you actually mean that uh, Congress should set up a new committee to uh, look oh, into no, it? No, 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 no. No, I would not have Congress set up a new committee. There are ample committees already with jurisdiction, or there are committees with ample jurisdiction, the Banking and Currency Committee, the Finance Committee, the Joint Economic Committee, any one of them could look into it. Well. Uh, Senator Sparkman, this has been a year when uh, big businesses seem to get bigger. They merge with a lot of smaller businesses. Do you think that uh, this is a healthy sign for the economy? No, I do not. I think it's, uh, I think it's something that uh, uh, might, uh, might very well be a danger signal. Uh, we, we get a stronger economy and a better economy by having a multitude of uh, smaller businesses rather than having a concentration of uh, big businesses only. Senator, what is a big business? What's a small business? I'm never quite sure. That's about the hardest definition in the world. <laughs> in fact, I'm not sure that anyone has ever given a satisfactory definition. Back during the war, the uh, Defense Department set up an arbitrary definition of small business uh, to the effect that in a business, uh, was a small business if it and its affiliates or associates uh, did not employ more than 500 persons. Now that's a pretty broad definition. I think about the best definition I ever heard was one that was given, uh, I believe, by former Senator Benton of Connecticut. He said any business that wasn't able to maintain its own representative in Washington was a small business. Senator Sparkman, uh, you think small businesses are going to do well next year? Or is this going to be a coming year of very tough competition? Larry, a uh, small business uh, has been having a pretty hard time now for some time. These mergers are just one thing that you mentioned. Uh, I'm hopeful that uh, Congress will enact some legislation that will make it uh, easier for small business. I hope there will be a careful checking into this uh, movement of uh, mergers, monopoly and uh, restrictive uh, practices of that kind. And then I think some, something ought to be done uh, positively for small business. By the way, I'll remind you that President Eisenhower, in announcing his program a few years ago, a few uh, days ago, indicated that uh, he would uh, advocate some such uh, remedial legislation for the benefit of small business. Well, that'll have to start in your committee, though, Senator, won't it, next time? The, that's mm -hmm. true. The, the, the Banking and Currency Committee is mm -hmm. the committee that has uh, legislative uh, jurisdiction. I am a member of that committee. Mm -hmm. well, how about the well-known consumer Senator Sparksman, how are we going to make out? Is this going to be a period of stable prices, or are they going to go up too? I hope that it'll, it could be a period of stable <laughs> prices. Uh, things are pretty stable right now. 
And if we can maintain the present stability, the consumer will not be uh, uh, too uh, badly caught. Well, Senator Sparkman, as a member of the Foreign Relations Committee, are you satisfied with the way that the administration conducted our foreign relations in the past couple of years? Uh, well, you know, I'm a great believer in uh, bipartisan foreign policy, or as Senator Vandenberg uh, used to say, non-partisanship in uh, foreign policy. And I, I don't like to uh, say something that might sound uh, partisan with reference to foreign policy. Uh, I have said this many times, and I think I'm correct in it, that uh, unfortunately, uh, our friends in the Republican Party made the foreign policy a political issue in 1952. You remember they promised the people something new and dynamic. Now, they tried to deliver on that for about the first uh, 15 months or 18 months of the, ca of the administration, and they got us into hot water a good many times. But, uh, and we actually lost the initiative back about the time of the trouble in Indochina when it broke, then the Berlin Conference, and then the Geneva Conference. But finally, uh, I think we regained the initiative, and I'd say that for the last uh, two or three months or so, uh, we've been doing very well. You think we'll have a bipartisan foreign policy or a nonpartisan? I, I, I hope we'll have, uh, either you want to call it, I hope it will be completely bipartisan or nonpartisan. That means that uh, the Democrats will be willing to take off on the takeoffs as well as the crashes? Yeah, yeah, you mean be in on the takeoff as yeah. well as the crashes. That is correct. Yes, a prior consultation, I think, is probably a good way to state it. Well, Senator Sparkman, you Democrats have always been known as big spenders. How do you feel about these proposed uh, financial programs for Asia, so-called Marshall or Stassen plans? Well, you know, we haven't been... Uh, given much on uh, that uh, program. A lot of it has come as rumor, and then uh, somebody would come along and deny it. I, I don't mind stating my own views. It was uh, indicated at first that we were going to have a Marshall Plan for Asia. You know, a Marshall Plan for Europe was fine, because we were dealing there with uh, nations that had a high productive level prior to the war. They had the machinery and the equipment with which to, uh, and the trained personnel with which to do the job. Now in, in Asia and the underdeveloped countries of the world, that's not true. They don't have the techniques and the skills and the plants and the equipment. So uh, w when you talk about a Marshall Plan, if you're thinking the kind of a plan we had in Europe, it just won't work in those countries. I I'll tell you in a few words what I think will work. That is a good, active point four program, sharing skills and techniques with those people, using those uh, skills and techniques to find out what uh, uh, programs of economic development might be worthwhile. And uh, then having uh, some kind of a loan and grant program to help those countries with an economic development within their own country. Now, that kind of program that will work. You Democrats seem to be getting more and more moderate now. <laughs> I oh, no, that's... we've always advocated that kind of a program. <laughs> well, I'd like to ask you, since we've seen in the previous presidential campaigns uh, that uh, it's very difficult for a Southerner to actually become a national figure, do you think it is possible for a Southerner, a conservative Southerner, to move north and become a national presidential camp? Con uh, <coughs> nominee? Well, Larry, I might say facetiously, I can't conceive of a Southerner moving north. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't mean that. But uh, getting back to your <coughs> question, I have never felt that it, the uh, geography ought to bar a person from eligibility on the national ticket. I, I just won't uh, concede that a Southerner hasn't as much right there as a man from any other section of the country. Well, what about the prospects of a liberal Northerner moving south, we'll say, then, and becoming the, uh, <coughs> the nominee of the entire South? I, I, I just don't go along with you about the moving from one section to another in order to become a candidate. I, I don't think uh, a man ought to be barred uh, by reason of, the, of his living in any particular section of the country. 
Well, Senator, you, uh, in 1952, before you were nominated for the vice presidency, you, uh, you ran uh, Senator Richard Russell's campaign, didn't you, in Chicago? Yes, I was supporting Senator Russell. Well, Senator Sparkman, since you were, of course, the vice presidential candidate in 1952, what do you think uh, the chances for the same ticket running again, you and Adlai, for uh, 1956? Well, Larry, uh, let me say this. I'm, I'm very strong for Governor Stevenson for 1956, and I think he will be our candidate. Now, as you know, a good many factors enter into the selection of vice president. You try to balance the ticket. Uh, I have no idea what uh, the requirements may be in 1956 or in what way it needs to be balanced or anything. You, uh, you, you just don't run for vice president. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly for Governor Stevenson for our presidential uh, candidate, and I believe he will be it. Well, actually, uh, Senator Sparkson, you said before that you objected to people from any region not being able to represent the whole country nationally, but it certainly was true. A formula was elected at erected in Chicago where a liberal northerner or a moderate northerner and a uh, liberal southerner yourself made up the Democratic ticket. And won't the formula be the same in 1956 as it was in 1952? Well, uh, well it could be or it could... Uh, the, the other factors may enter into it by that time. Uh, I, I don't know what uh, the issues will be or we don't know who will be on the other ticket, the, the Republican <laughs> ticket that might serve to uh, balance that, don't you see? I see what you mean, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Sparkman, for coming up here tonight and talking to us. Well, I've enjoyed being with you. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lesseur and Robert Trout. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable John J. Sparkman, the United States Senator from Alabama. An important contribution which Longines watchmakers have made to the science of timing was to originate the idea that sports events should be timed with identical watches of known and proven accuracy. Now to implement this idea, Longines created a series of new watches, accurate second by second, which timed to a fifth, a tenth, and a hundredth of a second. In observatory tests, these watches show a degree of accuracy greater than that required by all international sports and contest associations for timing world's records. The investment of millions of dollars and years of time in the development of ever finer timepieces has resulted in new watchmaking principles and methods that have made it possible to give greater accuracy and dependability to all Longines watches, including the Longines watch which you now wear on your wrist. So when next you buy a watch, either for yourself or as an important gift. Remember, you may buy and own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold in service from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. At Longines Whitnor Jewelers see Atmos, the perpetual motion clock created by Lecoultre. Atmos runs without winding, without electricity, powered only by variations in the temperature of the atmosphere. Atmos, product of Lecoultre, Division of Longines Whitnor.